Nothing is more basic to home brewing than your fermentation vessel. Today, we're talking to Olivia Papala from Beer.ology about fermentation vessels. We're going to talk to her about her brewing experience, and then we're going to turn to the community, and we're going to ask them about their fermentation vessels. We're going to do all of that today on Homebrewing DIY. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the cruisin ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast. And that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruisin. They are no match for scrubber duckies and you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Building recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on the show like the tilt hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look. I shopped around for a place to post my podcast, and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the podcast that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing, gadgets, contraptions, and parts. This podcast covers it all. Today, we're talking to Olivia Papala of Beer.ology about fermentation vessels. And then we're going to turn to the homebrewing community, and we're going to ask them about the vessels that they ferment in and why. But first, I'd like to thank all of our patrons over at Patreon. Your support keeps this podcast on the air and coming to you every week. We have a couple of cool promotions going on right now. If you give it the $1 level to the first 20 supporters, you're going to get access to our ad-free RSS feed, and you're going to get a logo sticker mailed to you. I also write you a nice little thank you note, so support us today. We also have a new promotion going on, so if you sign up at the $5 level, 
you're going to get a set of scrubber duckies until we run out of them. That's a $25 value. And I want to thank our sponsor, Scrubber Duckies, for helping out. Head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY and support us today. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. You can also support the podcast by going to ratethispodcast.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. Your rating is going to help others find the show. And the last way you can support the show is by going to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and using the Brewfather and Adventures in Homebrewing links. Those links go to their stores and don't change any of the prices, but it tells them that Homebrewing DIY sent you, and then they support the show. So head over to homebrewingdiy.beer today. Well, that's it for announcements, so let's just dive into today's show as we talk to Olivia Papala about fermentation vessels. I'd like to welcome Olivia Papala to the show. How are you, Olivia? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much for coming on Homebrewing <laughs> DIY. So a bit of background on Olivia. She She's she's actually got the background of a, of a chemistry teacher, uh, and mm-hmm. she's uh, been teaching chemistry, uh, and, and but then she's trying to apply that to homebrewing. Uh, big beer enthusiast for a long time. And has just started homebrewing, uh, and so welcome, Olivia, and let's uh, talk about a bit about what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, as far as me with beer, I've kind of always had a fascination since beer ever since uh, I guess I turned 21. Uh, but the biggest influence of the beer loving that I've kind of had has been my brother. So he's actually the one that got me into homebrewing. Uh, he's probably been homebrewing now for about four years. So me, I'm living out here in California right now. And I originally grew up in New Jersey. So growing up in New Jersey, came out to California for college and fell in love with it. And so I stayed. And so that's how I ended up teaching chemistry and geology out here. Uh, but every time I would go back for the holidays or for the summer, my brother and I, our thing would be beer. So we would either hit up a brewery on the East Coast, which there aren't that many in comparison to California. So I've kind of gotten spoiled out here. So now I'm telling him to come out to California and see me. But um, our big thing was every time we got together, we would like to brew a beer. So my first beer that I brewed was probably about two and a half years ago. That was an amber ale. So I was kind of really into the ambers and all like that really malty type of beers back then. Again, my palate's kind of always changing. It's right now I'm all about the juicies. Then the next I'm all about the lagers. And then I was all about the amber. So my first one was an amber. I was really excited to do it. And so I told my brother, I was like, I'm really into ambers right now. Can we please brew an amber together? And he hasn't, he hasn't done that before because he's super about all the juicies and the IPAs. So it was about Christmas, we brewed our amber, and then he was able to ship over a bottle to me to California for me to try it. And I was like, wow, this is actually really cool. But I didn't get into brewing um, until just like four months ago. Uh, To me, every time I went back home and I brewed with my brother, I kind of just sat back and watched him and I was like, this looks way too complicated. What is all these chemicals that you're adding in? How come you have this? What's that? You know, I just look at like, the CO2 tank and um, what's it called? Oh, the regulator and his chiller and all that. And I'm just like, this just looks way too technical for me. So I, I always kind of was scared to brew unless if I was with him. But this year I was kind of like, you know what? Like, doesn't really seem that bad. I've done it a couple of times. So let me try to do it on my own. So I went out and I got all my equipment. Um, and then it was November. I brewed my first beer. And so that was a pale ale. I was originally supposed to go for an IPA, but my wort temperature wasn't as high enough. So it kind of turned out to be a pale ale, but it wasn't that bad. And then, so ever since then, I was like, you know what? I think I could do this. So now I'm trying to brew a beer every single time I get a chance. So it's kind of been cool. That's, that's awesome. And, and just to kind of put some, uh, some, some color to this, you know, you, you kind of went all in the, the to almost the advanced methods. Uh, I, I think one of the things when when I saw you brewing your first beer, uh, 
just so you know, uh, uh, Olivia has a really amazing uh, Instagram feed, and I highly recommend you following it. It's uh, beer dot ology. That's uh, uh, beer ology with a dot right after beer, uh, and and you can kind of see her journey. But one of the cool parts of it is is that on her first batch, she's already fermenting in a keg. She's uh, are 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 you doing extract or all grain? What what are you doing there? Uh, I'm just doing all grain right now. So I've been doing brew in a bag. So I start off with my grain bill, depending on what the recipe is and uh, brewing in the bag as far as that's kind of, yeah, just what I'm doing right now. And then yes, I am fermenting in my corny keg right now. So it's kind of like a, like an all in one type of process. Yeah. And that, and that's kind of, uh, I, I got to say, like, for me, it's I started brewing extract, right? Uh, I think that that's where a lot of people start. Uh, randomly, my first beer I ever brewed was an Amber Ale as well. And I think, oh, nice. it, yeah, there you, you go. We already have a lot in common. <laughs> totally. And if you talk to a lot of uh, people who brew and you talk about their history, I'm going to guess that there was a lot of Amber Ales <laughs> brewed first, too. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand of that is that, uh, you know, it, I didn't go all grain until I was five or six batches in, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's the normal progression of what you see from homebrewers is kind of start with extract, learn how to ferment, and then move into the all grain because that, you know, mashing temperatures and things like that are uh, places to, you know, it's another variable to add. It is, yeah. And that's something that I'm still trying to fine tune to. So I'm in an apartment and I have an electric stove. And I'm trying the best that I possibly can getting my strike temperature on my electric stove. And it takes forever for me to brew, but I mean, Hey, I'm able to get it done. So. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and that's the key, but I think that brew in a bag specifically and just heads up. I, I brew in a bag. I brewed, I brewed 20 gallons on uh, Sunday with a, with a, with my boss actually, which was a lot. 20 gallons. Yep. And, uh, and we, and, I brewed 10 gallons of that 20 in a, in a bag. And then my, my boss, he brewed another 10, but the, but the idea is that, uh, you know, for me, brewing a bag is the way that I brew too. Uh, because Hey, it's easy. It works. I like my setup to be very simple and that's, and that's kind of at least my approach. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with brewing any other way as well. Uh, I, Mm -hmm. I think there's no wrong way to brew. Um, but the idea is that, uh, for me, it's just that I, I, I brew in a bag and I think that uh, it, it makes going to all grains so much more accessible for people. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it totally does. I mean, I always think about it just like a giant tea bag. You know, you have your tea leaves in there. You're just steeping it for however long you want and then you pull it out and you're done. And it's kind of makes it super easy. I don't know how some people do it without a bag. I just give them props. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, and, and to be honest, all of this is variations of that anyway, right? So mm-hmm. if, if you brew with a mash tun, the mash tun it, itself is the bag. Um, whether you have a false bottom or you're using rice holes or whatever you're using to kind of make it so you don't get a stuck sparge, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that uh, you're, you're still kind of going through that same process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so kind of cool. Well, we're, what we're here today to talk about is a bit about fermentation vessels. That is actually our topic today. And uh, Olivia so nicely decided to join me uh today and talk about these thank you so much for being on the show again uh let's talk a bit about your fermentation vessel i I know that you 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 did say you ferment in a keg uh tell me tell me why you decided to do that and you know i think most people start with things like buckets or carboys and and why did you go straight for a keg Uh, So one of the main reasons why I wanted to go straight to a keg is pretty much just for sanitation purposes. I feel like the more you have to transfer your wort or, you know, whatever, whenever you have a transfer, you're always going to run into some sort of sanitation problem. And you want to make sure, of course, that you're spraying down everything with, you know, your star sands and and all that. But my brothers kind of just helped me out and kind of coached me through. And he's like, you know what, you don't really need to get all this extra stuff. If you're going to have a carboy and you're eventually going to want to keg it, then you could kind of just skip that process and just go straight into kegging. And so, um, what really helps is having the, it's like a floating dip tube. So the one specifically that I have is a, it's called a clear beer draft system. So it's kind of like if you've ever gone fishing and you've used a bobber, it's pretty much that. 
So what it does is that you have a giant uh, metallic sphere that's filled with air, and then on it has the little, I guess, part of like, like your dip tube. So instead of pulling beer from the bottom of your keg, you're able to pull beer from the top of your keg. So it kind of floats, and then you're getting your top portion as you're, you know, pulling out your pe pulling out your beer from your corny keg. So um, the reason why I was kind of able to pull off fermenting in the corny keg is because all of that sediment is going to eventually fall down to the bottom. And so since it will be down at the bottom, I'm pulling my beer from the top. So as it's fermented, rather than having to transfer it, it's already in there. And so I'm just able to kind of do like a all in one, I guess you could say. Okay. And, and so the idea is that uh, when you're done fermenting, you don't even have to transfer it into another vessel. You're just cold crashing it, dropping all the sediment and the true yeah. to the bottom. And That's then you just start drinking the beer off the top. And then once it gets super cloudy, it's gone. That's exactly it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's uh, I, that's actually a really innovative way of approaching it. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I've done, I, I have personally fermented in a keg before as well. Mm -hmm. And all I did is I, I went and took my dip tube and I shaved about an inch off the top of it. Right. So okay, you go. Kept, the same dip tube, kept the same dip tube uh, mm -hmm. and went and just, you know, took about two inches off of it. So it didn't get all the way to the bottom. Yeah, kind of right at the turn and then i would just go in and i actually did a closed transfer through my keg system to uh, go into another keg so still not exposing it to air that's the whole goal okay. here right yes but, yes but but the idea is that uh doing so means that uh you're it's it's a quick and easy hack to kind of get the same results but i still have a transfer you don't right so really yeah that's, cool that's nice way. to have a transfer yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's really that's that is nice. It's like, hey, ferment, uh, ferment in your basement, throw it in the fridge, drink beer. I mean, that's uh -huh. and it, yeah, and super easy. And then it also makes the cleanup. You know, it's like less to clean up. You just have one vessel to clean, and that's it. <laughs> totally. And when you're done, uh, you also have uh, like that yeast cake in the bottom, right? But yeah. on the <laughs> other, but the other thing is, is because you've chilled it, it's just like one thick cake that kind of just comes out all in one piece. Yeah. And you know what? The crazy thing, actually, with the last beer that I, I brewed, I didn't even know that I tapped it. So I, I brought this keg over to a party and all of our friends were drinking my home brew. And of course, they love that because they're like, hey, free beer. Oh, and you brewed it. That's awesome. Um, but we were just drinking, drinking, drinking all night. And then all of a sudden it just stopped pouring. I was like, I was expecting by the time that that uh, floater, you know, like the, the floating draft system, by the time that that went down and reached the trub, I thought for sure it would be pulling some of that sediment in, but it has a really good filter on it. And it was pulling clear beer until it was perfectly tapped. And I was like, wow, that was actually kind of interesting. But again, that was a pale ale. So I don't know how it would do with my, you know, twice dry hopped IPA that I have in the fridge right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing is, is that you have to look at like a uh, uh, when you take beer, even though you have yeast in suspension and you get it cold down to uh, serving temperatures, mm -hmm. uh, that yeast cake gets really compact and thick at the bottom. You really see a big separation and good clarity in the beer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that I mean, to be honest, that's what lagering is, right? Uh, yeah. If if you lager a beer for months on end at really cold temperatures, uh, to actually lager a beer, uh, it has to be sitting on yeast. That is actually part of the definition of lagering. It has to be beer sitting on yeast at a very cold temperature, and you age it that way. And then once you actually, if you were to rack it off of the yeast and then put it into a keg, you're no longer lagering it. So mm -hmm. kind, of, mm -hmm. kind of a weird thing. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it... it that actually doesn't surprise me that you got clear beer all the way until it stopped pouring. That yeah. doesn't surprise me at all. That's cool. Have you, yeah. have you brewed a lager before? I brewed a lot of lagers. Uh, I've, uh, I usually brew lagers this time of year. Uh, I haven't uh -huh. brewed one this year, but I, I sure will soon. Uh, but I, I, so my fermentation chamber, uh, is, uh, is a dorm fridge with a wood box attached to the front of it that I kind of built out because it's a dorm fridge, it tends to lack the juice in the summer to get me a lager. So yeah. it, that, that is a, that is a struggle I have with just my fermentation chamber. So in the winter, I, I bust out all my lagers, uh, drink those through the spring. I do all my ales in the summer, move to dark beers towards the beginning of winter. So it's almost lager season for me right now. 
That's cool. Have you heard of, because I have one of those little dorm fridges too, and I know that they don't get as cold as we kind of want them to. So I actually just bought, it's called an Inkbird uh, temperature probe. But what I'm able to do, I'm actually looking at the box right now. Uh, so it's a plug and play temperature controller. So I'm able to hook this up to that little fridge and it's able to kind of put in that juice that you were just talking about that we were kind of missing. And it's able to make my mini fridge much cooler than it's actually set to be. Have you ever heard yeah. of that? Before? Yeah. So uh, because the uh, Inkbird uh, temperature controller runs off the plug, you just turn it to max, right? And uh, yeah. yeah, it just, and, and it also, the cool thing about an Inkbird is, is that it has that little feature in there that makes it so it doesn't overrun your compressor. So uh -huh. uh, if it if it's going to turn it back on, it'll give it a 10 minute delay. So you don't burn up your compressor in your fridge. I, I love Inkbirds. They're great. Um, they've been, uh, they've been a big supporter of me. They've been a big supporter of the podcast. I've done a couple of uh, Instagram giveaways with them. They've been awesome. So I oh, love nice. Inkbirds. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I have that then. So I know I'm on the right track with that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, I, I've got a few Inkbird controllers throughout the house. Personally, my fermentation controller is kind of a homebrewed thing that I've built. Uh, I use Fermentrack and it's uh, it's more of like a, a science project in that uh, I had to bust out my soldering iron and build some stuff. But, um, and, and those listening to the show, if you go back to, I believe, show number eight, um, we did an interview with maker for men track, uh, John Beeler, but, uh, that's, uh, that's what I use to run my fermentation chamber and it has a PID algorithm in it. And so what a PID does is it, it actually factors in the overshoot of your refrigerator. I also have a heater in my fermentation chamber as well. And so it can actually get me temperatures within a 10th of degree of whatever number I put. Super cool. Yeah, and and my beer never changes uh, temperature. It's it it's like super duper solid uh, temperature control. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Do you like also experimenting with different type of yeasts for different type of fermentation temperatures? Like, say for example, the I think I'm saying it wrong. The kvike, the kvike yeast. You're saying it right. Uh, oh, okay, good. Is the right <laughs> way to say it. Uh, yeah. So uh, kvike is uh, a beer I have not made yet. And I've done now a couple of podcasts talking about Kvike and uh, mm. have not actually made a beer with it. I am a really bad homebrew podcaster. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're just waiting for the right time. That's what it is. So we yeah. know we're waiting for summer where we can't get our temperatures cool enough for that. <laughs> well, you know, you're in Southern California and your groundwater doesn't get cold enough in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, forget about chilling my wart temperature in the summer. That's going to take forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in the summertime, when that happens and you get it down to like 80, just know you can pitch some kvike and it'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that for my next one. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, yeah, a bit about my fermentation vessel so that we can uh, talk a bit about that. Uh, I use Fur Monsters, which are plastic fermenters. Mm. Um, they're... Uh, there, I actually have two of them. Uh, they're seven gallon fermenters. The uh, reason I use them is two reasons. They have a really big opening, right? So I can take the the lid, unscrew it. I can get my arm all the way in there and uh, and clean it. Also, when you ferment in a corny keg, very similar experience, right? You can yeah. totally get your arm all the way in there. You can clean really well. Uh, I'm lucky that. Uh, my arm actually does fit in there and I can get all the way to the bottom of a corny keg. Pretty awesome. Uh, but also the same goes with uh, my, my seven gallon for monster. I, I can open it up. I can clean it really easy. And I think that cleanliness when it comes to your brewery, specifically your fermenter is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I like about my fur monster is that I've kind of customized my now uh, my, my shows, the homebrewing DIY and I've even taken my fermenter and thrown my own kind of hacks to it. So my, my, my fermenters now have a, a, where I've actually drilled a separate hole in the top of it. So I have a, the center hole in the top of the lid that actually fits a, a, a bung or a cork. And that hole actually I use for a thermo well as part of my fermentation process, right? And the thermo well is basically a temperature probe that goes to the center of my beer. And that's how I keep my my beer temperature is really solid through my fermentation chamber because that's part of the PID process. You have to have a thermo well. That's awesome. That's pretty nifty. 
It is pretty nifty. But then on the on just to the left of that hole, I actually drilled a separate hole for my airlock. And what I've done is actually installed a ball lock. And just like you do, I go and you know just put a uh, a uh, the the air valve or the uh, the O2 valve, and I and I, yep, and I just do a blow off tube right into a thing of sanitizer, just like you would with a keg. And what that also allows me to do is still do uh, uh, transfers to my keg through the bottle, like through the the spout in the bottom, and then I can add some CO2 to the top of it and then just pressure change it to my keg and not have to actually have it touch any air. So, yeah, so you have no no transfers. Mm -hmm. I do transfer, but I still transfer oxygen free, and that's the goal. So that's why I use mine. Um, so what we're going to do today, Olivia, is we're going to, I, I went out to Facebook and I asked a bunch of questions to the community out there and uh, asked, and actually I'm going to read you what I asked. I said, hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you a question real quick to the community. So I actually said all of this. I don't know why <laughs> I type out like that. I said, uh, I'm curious what type of fermentation vessel that you use and why. Do you use a glass carboy? Why? Do you use a fermentation in a keg? Why? Did you spend $400 on a stainless steel conical fermenter? Why and what are the features, right? These are the the questions I kind of asked out to the the Facebook community. And I got a bunch of answers. And we're going to read off some of those answers today. And we're going to talk about uh, kind of these different approaches because I, I love it when I hear back from the people who listen to the show and engage with us uh, through social media. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're, you're ready to hear some of these? Yeah. Plus, it's always great to learn something new. So I'm kind of eager to see what everyone has to say and their own opinions about it. I'm the same way. I, I Every time I do this, I totally learn something new. And I've brewed for 10 years. Um, so it's, and it's, it's all cool. a learning process and I have so much to absorb. So I'm like a sponge right now. Just give it to me. <laughs> you got it. So, uh, Steven Boyojin, and I totally destroyed his name. Uh, but Steven said plastic buckets for rails. It does the job. The fermentosaurus for under pressure for loggers. And he gets a clean logger profile, ale temperatures, Kind of got to cut off here. Eventually, I'll save up to get a SS conical. So I I kind of responded to that and I said, "What's the benefit of uh, getting your your brew brew brewing loggers under pressure?" And he had a reply to that, and he said, "Hey, my for, by fermenting loggers at twelve to fourteen psi at sixty eight degrees, I am able to ferment a logger in as little as a week with no ester production, and also due to the temperature." It doesn't require the diacetyl rest. I recently finished an ultra clean light lager and was able to get it kegged and carved in 12 days. And that's pretty mind blowing to me. So, yeah. 12 days. Wow. Yeah. I yeah, mean, so, I pressurized my, you know, New England style IPA and it's been three weeks and I'm like, ah, I still think it needs another week or so. But wow. That's cool. Yeah. But the, but the idea is that, uh, I, I have heard that, uh, Doing some some loggers under pressure mm-hmm. is going to be something that's going to help you kind of make sure that you're not getting that ester production. But I, to be honest, I hadn't really got into the details of it. I've heard a couple podcasts on it. I probably read a little bit about it. But this is a really great piece of uh, uh, feedback in that you know that 12 to 14 psi. What do you know? What psi are you fermenting at in your keg? Uh, it's at 10 right now. Okay. Crash at 10 PSI. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's pretty close to 12, right? 12 yeah. to 14 PSI, 68 degrees. Uh, you know, but, but the fact that that pressure can really, you know, suppress some of that ester production is kind of cool. So, mm-hmm. and that's what the plastic ves- vessel that he's using. Yeah. So it's a fermentosaurus. Uh, you've probably seen those. They're kind of like a, a, a big plastic conical fermenter. Um, they uh, also have the the screw thing in the bottom that like collects the trube. Yes. Mm-hmm. You you've probably seen those, right? Yeah. Uh huh. I have. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's one of those. Uh, they are a, able to take. I 
think up to 35 PSI. Don't quote me on that because uh, I don't know the answer totally, but I, I do know they could take more than 12 to 14 PSI easily. Yeah, uh, I think they probably would just looking at the structure of it. Cause even just in my corny keg, I was trying to naturally ferment it. And that thing was bouncing up to about 20 to 25 PSI and it was doing okay. So, yeah. Uh, so kind of uh, a corny keg actually can handle up to 145 PSI. That's actually their, breaking point which is a lot more than you would ever use in, in beer yeah yeah and and actually uh have you ever used a do you use pin lock or ball lock kegs uh mine's a ball lock yeah so the ball lock has the pull tab to let the air out right mm -hmm. so with a pin lock keg they don't have that pull tab right they have they do have a, a blow off valve the same way but that actually fails i believe at 135 psi you're stuck then if yeah. you go over that, which you probably won't ever, but yeah. yeah. But that's actually the safety release. That safety release is actually meant to go and it'll actually start blowing air out of it or CO2 out of it once it gets to like 135 PSI. But so like other than that, regulated type of system. Yeah. It's so, so if you have a pin lock, the best way to bleed them is actually, I just take a, a key or a screwdriver and I just kind of push it down in it. And that's how I like kind of bleed them. Uh, push down the gas post. Uh, little trick there for you guys. All right, let's 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 read another one here. Uh, Michael Sutton. He's. I started with a mini SS brew bucket and a brew jacket control temp, and now I use a seven gallon brew bucket, chilling coils, and a seven gallon BME and a in a glycol chiller and a tilt to control both. I feel like it's worth the investment in being able to control temps efficiently and accurately. I use the brew bucket for lockers and the beers without dry hopping and then use the conical for things that I turn into a quicker or a dry hop. I've never used a carboy, seemed like a pain in the ass to clean, and fermenting in a keg, I feel like it would create a clogged tube or valves, so I've never really tried it. Hmm. So... Yeah, I, this guy's got quite a setup. Uh, a seven I gallon. Say, I yeah. was like, wow, I'm impressed. But at the same time, it's like, this is what's so fascinating. And I'm so grateful to be learning so much because everyone is like, as, as unique as the person is, it's unique to their brewing style, you know? And I think that's what's so cool. That everyone has a particular reason as to why they're doing whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah, so it's exactly. Cool to well, learn and that. the different systems are, it's kind of weird. You get your own system down and then you're, Beer tastes like your beer, right? Yeah. It's kind of, it's a very unique thing in that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, a couple of things here with this guy's system is he's got, you know, the seven gallon conical uh, with a glycol chiller and a tilt. I mean, this guy's super teched out. Uh, this is, this is a very, very high end fermentation system, but also on top of that, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate of the tilt hydrometer. Uh, the tilt hydrometer, obviously, the tilt, the, the hydrometer, you can kind of just drop right into your uh, into your fermentation and kind of log uh, your temperature and your gravity at the same time. Um, I have one. I love it. Uh, I, that is also part of my fermentation setup. And, and it's kind of then, you know, your beer's done. That's mm -hmm. kind of my, you know, like you just said to me a minute ago, you're like, hey, I've been waiting uh, for three weeks and I'm not sure because I'm not sure yeah. if it's ready. Uh, the cool thing about the uh, uh, the tilt is that if you have a tilt in there, once you see a flat line of, of a few days where your fermentation hasn't changed or your gravity hasn't changed, you know your beer's done. And mm -hmm. surprisingly, it happens in about four days for most of the beers I brew. So oh, That's super cool. That's a nifty little trick that that gadget has. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're super cool. Uh, highly recommend them. Or the, there's also the DIY version of that, which is the ice spindle. So there's kind of a couple... And there's a couple ways you could go after that one. Uh, there's also uh, a the 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 Plato airlock that also can kind of give you a similar reading as well. Mm. Uh, let's see, Niles. Uh, he says I use Big Math Bubblers from Northern Brewer. You can't beat the depth charge option for a huge dry hop addition. And I actually asked him, uh, "What's a depth charge depth charge option, and yeah, how does that help you?" Like, oh, these terms are above my knowledge base. <laughs> <What is that? laughs> 
I actually didn't know what it was either. So he said it's a it's a stainless steel mesh tube that attaches to the lid and is long enough to almost touch the bottom. And it's about four inches in diameter. So I've seen those. I think I've seen those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it easily handles up to six to eight ounces of hot pellets and allows for easy removal prior to throwing them into a keg. That's actually pretty big because, uh, you know, I've totally done like an eight ounce dry hop, put it in my keg and totally clogged my dip tube with uh, the hot particles. So. <laughs> so it's kind of like a spider, but it's kind of like built into the to the lid in a sense, where it's like, yeah. uh huh. Yeah, kind of like that. But then it's also meant for it's stainless steel, so you can get it clean, and mm. uh, and it's meant for the fermentation and dry hopping. It's it's a pretty cool little tool, and uh, you know, I think I might have to get me one. Check it out. That's a let us know. <laughs> I will. Well, you know, specifically, I think that would be a, a good thing for like hazy IPAs specifically. Yes. Yeah. Kind of like what I got going right now. So. Yep. So uh, Bob Sloan says, uh, I use a Brewer's Edge mash and boil. He ferments and then bottles from it. So uh, he's he's kind of got a setup like you and except for think of it as from kettle, but then he bottles. But the mm-hmm. idea is that he brews in his kettle get the temperature down in his kettle. And then uh, from there, he just puts a lid on it, puts a, puts a uh, uh, airlock on it, and actually ferments in his boil kettle. Oh, wow. I didn't even know you could do that. But it makes yes. sense. Yeah. Yeah, so Bruce Edge is an electric all-in-one kind of system. Like, a think a grandfather. There's mm-hmm. there's a few different versions of that. So Brewer's Edge is kind of one of those. Uh, but uh, I didn't realize that you could actually... Uh, mash boil and ferment in it so that's uh pretty does cool that, does that have like a lid that like seals shut so that way you don't get any op- oxygen in there yeah so it's gonna have a lid that seals shut you're gonna have to have an airlock on it just like you would uh but the idea is that you could you know it's basically like you're still gonna uh brew in it you're gonna mash in it boil in it get it chilled down and once the beer's chilled down you're just gonna slap you're gonna pitch your yeast slap the lid on it and then ferment right in the same vessel uh, and, cool. and, then, and then from there he goes straight to bottling, right? Yep, exactly. Nice. So that's like the all-in-one. That's like the all-inclusive <laughs> way of brewing. Yeah. And he says that he just puts it cool down on his old before pitching. He doesn't even actually put a chiller in. He just like gets <laughs> on and and leaves it sitting out, and then uh, pitches right when it gets cool enough. It's so. like a very like artisan way of brewing. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So I got Brian. Uh, I got Brian here, and he says, uh, I start with five-gallon brew buckets, went to 6.5-gallon buckets, then went to glass carboys, then to mini conicals, and now he's at an eight-gallon brew craft bucket for the last seven years or so. Cheap, clean, easy to stack and store, seal, great, perfect from five-gallons to 60-gallon batches. He has nine of these. And uh, I need to have, he goes, "I I have no need for conicals at my scale. So that's what Brian says. Cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, that I, I got to admit that, like, I brewed in a bucket for a long, long time. Brewing in a bucket's easy. Once again, you get your arm in there to clean out your fermenter, which I think that cleanliness is, to me, one of the more important parts. So being able to get your arm in there and clean it is something that's great. Uh, and the other thing about buckets is they're cheap. They mm-hmm. work and they're cheap. And so, you know, if you, if you're, and, and if you've got nine of them and you're brewing 60 gallon batches, Hey, you yeah, you're all set. You better than that. Right. <laughs> you need to throw down 400 bucks on one of those conicals, but <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> on them, you know, but still. <laughs> yeah. Phil Ad- Adelson. Let's see what he says. I started with uh, the Mr. Beer uh, LBK because that is what was in the kit. And then I moved to a three-gallon plastic carboy because they were inexpensive and not hard, too hard to clean. And I just made the shift to fermenting in cornies for a few reasons. Stainless steel, easy to clean. I want to ferment under pressure. And I use a corny is a, a used corny is a hell of a lot cheaper than an SS fermenter. So uh, yeah, stainless steel fermenters are very expensive. If you want to ferment in stainless steel, the the cheapest and easiest way to get into that is through corny keg, right? Mm-hmm. And I think everything that he just mentioned hits on the nail as to why I'm deciding to use the corny keg as a fermenter. 
And just like how you're saying with the ease of being able to stick your hand and clean. Um, and then just, just the price, you know, like for example, my corny keg, I got used and I think I only paid like 70 bucks for that one. And I mean, in some places you could probably get them even cheaper. Um, I know a new one could be anywhere from like a hundred to 150, but that's still much, much, much cheaper than, you know, one of these conicals that you could get, especially like what you were saying with the stainless steel ones. Yeah. And, and, and actually you can get a brand new corny keg. I, I think if you get them on sale, uh, if you, if you go to my website and click on the adventures in homebrewing, uh, square, uh, you can go over there and those guys, uh, will put, uh, their, their cornies on sale brand new for 75 bucks sometimes. Uh, there you go. yep. <laughs> and, and, and even brand new, not on sale, they're only 90 bucks. So you could definitely get one for cheap. Um, there, there, there's definitely corny kegs out there brand new that are less than a hundred dollars that you can find. And then plus then you'll have the keg for being able just to, you know, put your beer on tap anyway. So exactly. Exactly. Uh, let's see here. I have, a, I actually got a lot of, I got a lot of comments on this. So let's see. We got Greg Turley says, I have a flex and a flex plus. And I wanted to move to a stainless steel fermentation vessel, and these were a great place to start. I was drawn to the T.C. fittings, and they fit inside my fridge for cold crashing. And the racking arm also allows me to find that sweet spot, transfer beer, but not yeast. And I start to transfer into a mason jar. And then I move the racking arm until I get the yeast and then move up slightly and continue transferring to the keg or the bottling bucket. I got the Flex Plus on Cyber Monday at 20% off, and it allows me to press or to do pressure transfers. So he's got a couple, the Flex and the Flex Plus, and I'm actually going to pull this up so I know what it looks like. He's able to fit this in his fridge? I'm, I'm Googling it as we speak. <laughs> this is... Yeah, yeah I, the, the spike it, brewing from Flex Fermenter. Yeah, I think if you have a stand-up fridge without any shelves in it, it would fit in there. Yeah, but I would see that the arm would be extending outward too much. That's why I'm wondering, how is he fitting it in his fridge to... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe he, he's got to have a pretty big fridge. Um, uh, it's got to... You know, also, if it's only a five gallon or a six gallon fermenter, even with the legs, it's not going to be that big. It seems yeah. bigger than it could be. It looks uh, but, bigger, if anything. Yeah, yeah. It it looks kind of, I mean, thing is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, is. Yeah. It looks like so, uh, something I would find in Willy Wonka's factory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely. <laughs> Yeah, they're definitely not cheap either. They're you know two hundred and fifty bucks stainless steel. Uh, the, but yeah, this thing is definitely uh, got all the the bells and whistles with it, right? Mm -hmm. So wait, what was he saying as far as the um, pressurizing with that? Wait, so did, did because it's stainless steel, you could do pressure on it, right? Uh -huh. And he does pressurized transfers, right? So the idea is that you're gonna gas in the top and move it to a, a, his keg. Um, okay. The other thing that he does is it, that was pretty cool is that it has that it has the arm on it that allows you to uh, to rack, and he actually goes and dips it right in the yeast at first and pulls a bunch of yeast right into a mason jar and then lifts the arm up into the beer and then racks the beer off the yeast. So, kind of a nice way to get your yeast out as well. Yeah. Uh. And then let's see. I've got uh, I've got one more we can go through. Uh, I've got Tim Carly who said who said I started with uh, buckets and carboys. Then I went to a stainless steel eight gallon conical, which I got for two hundred and fifty bucks on sale at More Beer. And I like the ease of it fermenting and and the fermenting test dumping uh, grub and secondary cleanup is easy. Um, so you know Tim loves a stainless steel conical fermenter. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know when it comes down to the the funny thing that that's kind of on here is that uh, none of the people that kind of responded to this are fermenting in glass carboys. Yeah, that's actually kind of surprising because I thought that was honestly one of the most common fermentation vessels. I mean, 
for a long time I did I, I actually still have some glass carboys. I have a couple three gallon ones. I used them to make some mead and recently I think that was the last time I used them. Uh, but I actually got rid of glass carboys out of my brewery about five years ago. I had a, I and here's why I had a friend. He dropped his and had to get uh, reconstructive surgery on his arm. And oh, no. uh, at that point, I was like, glass is not in my brewery. Oh, geez, yikes. Yeah. Well, I could see why the plastic ones would be much more beneficial than the glass ones. But, oh, man. Yeah. I mean, but there and, and I this is something that uh, I've heard. I I personally ferment in plastic. Or stainless steel; those are the kind of two materials that that I ferment in. But uh, you know, the, I I think that when it comes to glass, a big reason that people use glass is that a it's easy to clean; it doesn't really scratch, so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, so you get those same benefits as stainless steel. You're but you're going to get it for about thirty bucks. So yeah. I, I think those are the benefits of glass. I think uh, another too is yeah. that. It's it's super fun just to watch your yeasties do their thing. You know what I mean? That's kind of like with with the fermenting in my keg, I'm kind of just not being able to observe them and just watch what you're doing. But when you're watching through, you know, your your glass carboy, it's kind of fun just to see what they're doing on a day to day basis. You don't get that fireworks show anymore. <laughs> yeah, the, that that does suck that you can't see it. But then on the other hand of it is, is that having it dark like that is also a really big positive because if it's dark it's not getting light to the beer which is also not going to produce an off light flavor nothing mm-hmm. like you know if you keep it in a dark spot it's probably going to be okay but yeah. you know you know that's still if you're going to be a purist that could be one way of looking at it as well does uh does light also affect your activity of the yeast it doesn't i don't think affect the activity but uh a beer that gets light struck can uh, give a skunky off flavor. That's why yeah. they always say never bottle in green bottles, right? Or clear bottles. That's why you need to drink lime with a Corona. <laughs> <laughs> so we clear all bottles, know what isn't it? Lime is for. <laughs> <laughs> or, or like if if you've had a Heineken or a a, a, a green bottle Heineken from from back Rolling in the day. Rock. Yeah, yeah Rolling, Rolling Rock, right? Yeah. They they always kind of had that skunk flavor or Mickey's Big Mouths, right? Uh, yeah. And the thing is, is that age with light is also really bad because the more light struck it gets, the more it's you're you're kind of opening it up to that, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, if it's fresh and it's got some light on it, it's probably going to be okay. But then the longer it goes, it's going to get more and more skunky. We we want dank, but we don't want that type of dank. <laughs> no, exactly. You must live in California. <laughs> <laughs> I've never guessed. <laughs> Well, I I live in Colorado too. So oh, so uh, you definitely. you're even ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so Olivia, uh, I think that's kind of it for the feedback on uh, fermentation vessels. Uh, uh, I really want to thank you for uh, being on the podcast. Uh, no, thank you. Honestly, this has been such a learning experience. Just from this conversation that we've had, it's already opened up so much more to me now. And now I'm able to understand all the different fermentation vessels because I myself, you know, just on Instagram and, and watching other home brewers, I'm just like, how come they use this? What is this? What is that? And now that just cleared up so much. So now I understand the difference between your conicals and your your glass carboys and the plastics. And they even have like these... Um, plastic conical like balloon shaped things and now it just makes total sense to me as to why everyone has certain options for their certain beers and so thank you for the learning experience it's been awesome oh dude thank you so much for coming on the show (laughs) and and so just to anybody who's listening head over to instagram you you gotta follow beer.ology uh it's a great uh it's a great instagram profile she she goes to a lot of breweries it's not just home brewing uh so <laughs> if if you're a beer lover she gets to go to all the good ones uh she she goes to bottle logic all the time one of my favorite oh breweries, so. yeah i love that one <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, I, my heart is there so <laughs> every time every time you go there i'm super jealous and uh, yeah i love that one and uh it's probably one of my favorite southern california breweries so uh so definitely but, spoiled down here. There's way too many good ones. So yeah, yeah, we're spoiled here in Colorado. So you know, if, if there's if you ever want to do a beer swap, let me know. Oh yeah, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
Awesome. So, well, Olivia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, and, and like I said, uh, if you want to, if you want to find uh, uh, Olivia's uh, Instagram account, just look in the show notes, head over to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer. Um, I'll definitely put links to all of her stuff there. So you, so you can uh, kind of check out what she's doing and uh, thanks for being on homebrewing DIY. Yeah. Thank you so much. I can't wait to tune in and listen in and see what else you guys got in store. I'd like to thank Olivia for taking the time to be on this week's show. It was a really great conversation, and I really had a great time. I also had a bit of audio trouble, so uh, it was on my side and not hers, so sorry about that. I swear I will fix it next week. Also, if you'd like to follow Olivia, head over to the website, homebrewingdiy.beer. I'll have links to her Instagram account, and you can check out her and all of the cool brewing things that she's doing. Well, that's it. We'll see you next week on Homebrewing DIY.